Good morning, everybody. So my name is Christina Kiesel, and I'm going to talk about the five elements of urban architecture. And yeah, this is what I usually do on Saturday mornings. So why am I showing this to you, actually? Um, when preparing for this speech, it was actually the first time that I really had to think about why am I where I am right now. So why am I doing what I'm doing in my job? I never, usually I give speeches on some technical issues, on my research, or I teach classes. You have facts there. You don't have to think about yourself in these cases. Um, so what are you going to tell about yourself if you're talking about yourself? Uh, most people, or in most cases, you have these CVs and you pimp them and you have those fancy things that you show to people or send out when you want a new job. Um, but that's not very exciting, actually. <laughs> we all know how to do this. So then I thought about an article I read a few, I think, months ago. It was about the CV of failures. Who read that? Who knows about the CV of failures? Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, there was actually, I think he was a professor at some US university, as far as I remember. And one of his friends, she didn't get a job. She didn't get a professorship, I think it was. And so in order to motivate her, he made a CV of failures from his own career, where he showed not what he, what he was able to do, but what he didn't get. So it was quite interesting to read that and also to think about uh, people always show what they reached and what they have, where they have succeeded, but hardly ever anybody talks about how difficult that was or what are all the things, the backdraws and the difficulties you encounter in this way. So I'm not going to do a CV of failures because I don't want to think too much about that. Um, but I started to think, okay, when I was younger, what were the um, things that I thought I would do one day? And did I actually do them at the end? So I came up with five things um, that I thought I would do, uh, that I would reach when I'm older. And it starts with this picture, basically. Uh, at one time in my life, I mean, this picture is not that old, but I, I started drawing when I was like 13 or something. and. Deep inside me, one time in my life, I thought I'm going to be the best at it, you know? Like everybody who starts sport when they are 12, 12 13 years old, you think you're going to reach everything, you're going to be in the Olympics, you're going to be a world champion. So I didn't get there. I, I, I wasn't really good in it. <laughs> I enjoyed doing it, but nowhere close even, okay? But I still enjoyed it. So this is the first thing of the five that I didn't reach. But what happens when you don't reach something? You find something else you're going to do. So you find another thing. So I ended up actually thinking, OK, may maybe I should study something. If I don't become a world, championship in, a world champion in something, maybe I should think about a different career. So this is a picture of the main building of the technical university. So I decided to come here and to study something. And I decided to study, actually, architecture. So I'm not a computer scientist. I'm an architect by training. So why architecture? Why would you study architecture? So for me, it was, um, first of all, I always thought I'm going to be quite good at it. I started playing Lego when I was very little, like most of us probably. Yeah. The second thing is, architecture incorporates a lot of things. So you have classes on construction, on material sciences, but you also have classes on psychology, you have classes on urban planning, you have classes on design. So there's a lot of things that you can look at. And I thought that that's cool. That's really cool. You get a lot of insight in many things. For architects, it's always like you don't really know anything very well, but you know a little bit about everything. So it's kind of a weird uh, thing, actually. And the other thing was, in my family, I actually was kind of the black sheep, to put it that way, because everybody else is in medicine. So I'm actually the first one who is doing something technical. And I'm really the first one who's doing something in architecture. So they quite, they, they thought, OK, if she wants to, it would be much easier if she gets into medicine. But anyhow, they supported me. So I started uh, studying architecture. Indiana, because I was born here, I was raised here, and it was the easiest way to do it. 
I didn't even think about going anywhere else. So what are you doing when you're studying architecture? The picture you see here is a model that I built with two of my colleagues. It's a church in the south of Vienna. It's called Wotroba Kirche. I don't know if anybody knows it. Um, it consists of more than 130 of those cubes. And we started with a big piece of wood. So you can imagine how long that takes. I think we were working for a year on that. I didn't count the hours. Um, so studying architecture is not just about reading and studying and designing. It's also about getting your hands on and actually building something, something physical. So this was actually the nicest model I ever built. And it's going to be the nicest model I've ever built. Um, another thing about architecture that's quite cool is you get to travel, if you want to, if you're interested in foreign architecture. So what I did is uh, one of my first uh, uh, traveling with the university was to Samoa. So where is that? It's right on the other side of the world. So we traveled Samoa and Fiji and New Zealand and we did a study on uh, uh, the traditional or the architecture heritage of Samoa. That was also the first publication I was involved in. So it doesn't really look like th that much technical yet, but um, it was very interesting. And I tell you, it's a lot of fun to travel. <laughs> um, a part of that, I did also other travels, uh, more traveling and uh, spent quite a time abroad. And I also did what everybody does studying abroad. I did a few classes in New York which was also very interesting. So you see architecture, studying architecture is really fun most of the time. <laughs> um, but at the end, OK, I didn't, be, I didn't become a world champion in rowing or any other athletic sport. Uh, so I decided to study architecture. So what was the second thing I didn't reach? So when you uh, start studying something, you think you're going to be the best in that. So I thought, I'm going to be either a famous architect, or at least I'm going to work for one like one of these really big offices. So I don't know, does anybody know this building? It's the VU building, the new one. I just picked one that's, I think this one is from Sarah Hadid. So she was a very famous architect. So, um, but again, I'm not a famous architect and I'm not working for one of these really big, nice offices. Um, I've never been in one of these really big, nice offices, to be honest. Um, I'm still here. So how come? Um, because studying architecture is so much fun, I actually took, it actually took me 10 years to finish it. Uh, I was working at many offices and so on, but the thing is, once you start working, as, I don't know how it is in other studies, but in architecture, you kind of drop the studying part. <laughs> so after 10 years of studying, I finally decided, OK, now it's time to finish. Um, because I didn't want to go any to do any more design classes anymore. The thing is, with design classes, people basically judge your design and they tell you how you should design. And at some point, after you did that several times, you kind of get sick of it, to be honest. So I needed something different. So I was just looking for an easy way to finalize my studies and to find a master thesis. I shouldn't tell that to my professor. I hope he's not seeing that. So I found this topic posted on the TU web homepage. And I went there and I said, I want to do this. And I did my first scientific work. So this was after 10 years of studying, I started with my first really scientific work. Uh, and the topic was the impact of user and system assumption on energy simulation results. So no more design, no more traveling or heritage or whatever, something really technical, really straightforward. Um, this is a post I did later on on my master thesis. So what I started to do is uh, looking at how buildings work, how people influence the building uh, with every move. With just sitting here, we all change how the, the building works. Um, so I did that. And it seems I was, it seems like I was actually somehow successful because they actually offered me a job. So I started working for the TU at the Institut für Architekturwissenschaften, Architectural Science and Department of Building Physics and Building Ecology. And I started doing research there and teaching. So 
My research, most of it is on urban climate. And why is that so? Or why am I mostly going into urban stuff? Um, let's look at the motivation. This is, a, I think, um, you can see, can see it quite well in the back also. Uh, this is a picture from NASA. And it shows, it's a picture done from a satellite. And it shows basically where, where's the light on the world. And this shows you not only where the most people live, so where's the accumulation of people, but also where the energy goes. It's the world seen by night, and it's done in 2012 over a series of days. And you can see where the majority of people live. But what does that mean? So we now know that most of the people will basically live in urban environments in the future. So urban environments are the, the part that we need to look at. Um, what's the difficulty about urban environments is that the climate in urban environments functions different than what it does in rural environments. And the habitability is very important, as, as I said before, most of the people will live in those areas. Here's another picture where you can see where the mega cities in the future will be. So this is the motivation why I started doing research on how buildings, how architecture works in urban environments. Um, one part of that research was, for example, uh, collective housing, communal housing. Um, it's a study done in Vienna. It was my f the first thing actually I did when I was working here. I was working with a group who was looking at uh, space usage by people and also how much energy people need. So we, we used a lot of data from the Statistics Austria. And what we did is we were, uh, especially in Vienna, you have those old houses, like you can see the one below. Uh, it's a layout of a traditional Austrian building, like you see it all around here. And you have people living in there in very big apartments. And people don't tend to change the place they live in, the way they live when they grow older, but they tend to be more alone. So the apartments get bigger with less people in it. So we did a study on what would happen if people would ch change their lifestyle and would move together somehow like, like you do it when you're a student uh, in a share a home, share a flat. And we found actually out that you can have up to 20% of reduction in heating energy demand if you move together. And by moving together, I don't mean everybody has a room like you do it as a student, but by just having small apartments and shared spaces. And if we would just have 10% of people above 60 years old in Vienna who would do that, we would also save a lot of space. I mean, Vienna is growing, we need more living space, and we would save up to 3 million square meters of net floor area if 10% of the people above 60 would do that, which is quite amazing. Because what comes with that? It's not just about the space and not having to build houses, but when you imagine if a family could move into one of the inner, or even just to two blocks, or even one block. So and now, let's go and have a look at what is actually influencing uh, the urban climate and the architecture. So these were the five things that I came up with. Uh, fire, water, earth, air, and you. So why, what do I mean with fire? Fire, basically, is the sun. The sun, whether it's when, it's when the sun is shining, it influences how architecture works. It's not only the light, like now we have the blinds down so you can see the beamer. Um, it's also the heat. It makes things grow. It warms buildings up and everything. So on the left side, you can see some pictures. This is how we, for example, evaluate the, when you're standing on the ground and you look up, this is how we evaluate how much uh, sky you can see. And by the amount of sky that you can see, you can also calculate from that how much radiation comes into one spot. So with these pictures, we can calculate that. It's just an example for it. And on the right side, you have just a small image on, of a building 
where you can see what are the influencing factors for a building. You have the sun there, the radiation that comes in. You also have the people on there. Also, all the equipment, like a computer, they influence how buildings and therefore the architecture and the urban environment work. Um, Let's go to the second one, water. I didn't find any other pictures, so I put that one again. And I also think it's quite nice. <laughs> um, cities have to deal with water in very many different ways. You have, first, you have to supply people with drinking water. Then you have to do some sewage treatment because the sewage has to go away again. On the other hand, you have uh, the rain. Where is it going? And rain always comes in big amounts in a short amount of time. Uh, we call that stormwater management. That's the most difficult part. And, but there's also the humidity. There's evaporation from uh, people, from, from trees, and everything. And all this influences how the environment works. So water is the second important uh, thing to influence the urban microclimate. And then we have the earth. With earth, I mean all the soil. When you look at a city, you have a lot of streets that are um, uh, sealed, sealed surfaces which don't let through water. And on the other hand, you also have parks, for example, out there in the yard. And you have trees. Or you can even plant on the facade in order to have some earth or soil there. And those permeable structures are very, very important for the stormwater management and also for the climate in the city. And then we have air. This is actually a tower that's on top of the TU main building. You might not have seen it yet, but you can see the Karlskirche in the back. This is where we have our measurement equipment. And sometimes we even might have lunch up there because it's so nice and you have a few all over town. Um, but the air is important because with the air, I mean mostly also the wind. You need the air in thousands us to breathe. And also it takes away some of the um, pollution that we don't want. So it's an important part also to make places usable. And it's important part, for example, to enable cities to have enough wind and to get rid of all the things that come out of it. And then we have you. So we have the humans. We call it anthropogenic heat production. What goes in there? We have people. Each person produces heat, produces uh, garbage, whatever is done by humans, goes into this chapter. Big problem is the traffic. When you think about how much cars are out there, they need a lot of space. Not while driving, that's not the main problem, but while standing out there and waiting for you to come again and drive the car. Um, most of the surfaces are sealed. Now we're coming back to the problem of soil and impervious uh, um, areas. And they also heat up the city by burning processes. So they are bad in every way. <laughs> But still, we need something to get from one point to the other, and we don't have yet much better ideas for all the traveling we need to do. And then the third thing is a picture of um, air conditioning. Um, this one is especially disturbing for somebody being in urban climate, because when you think about it, all those small, tiny machines produce heat. So you're basically heating up the whole street, which you're trying to get the air from to cool your inside. So it's getting worse and worse the longer those things run. Um, I also put a picture here on how much anthropogenic heat we produce in the areas. So you can see there where the most settlements are, where the densest areas are. This is where the most anthropogenic heat is produced. So we try to break all of this down to some properties. I don't want to go too much into that. If you are interested, I can uh, show you a lot of papers on that that we have published. But this is how we expressed all those, uh, those five elements by geometric properties and surface properties. So 
Actually, we had a EU project on that topic, and we looked at the urban climate, and this EU project was not just on urban climate, but uh, mainly on the UHI phenomenon. I will just very quickly explain what it is. The UHI phenomenon is, the, is called um, urban heat island phenomenon, and it means that you have urban areas where it's warmer than in the comparable rural area. Why is it warmer? Because all these elements that I just showed you, they are influenced by the human being, by the urban environment. So you have buildings. Buildings heat, more, heat up more than trees. You have more humans in urban environments. They influence the whole environment. You have a lot of cars standing around. All of these things play in there, and that's why we have higher temperatures in urban areas. I just quickly want to show you some results, what we did there. Uh, it was a cooperation between a lot of Central European cities. And you can see that the temperatures in the cities are quite different, although they are all Central European. And on the right side, that's the interesting part. You can see the UHI intensity over a reference day. And what we can see there is that some of the cities react more strongly to the UHI effect than others, meaning that the urban planning, the urban architecture has an influence on the actual UHI because of the cities looking different. We can read that from this graph. So what we also did in this project, we're trying to, we tried to develop mitigation measurements. So we were thinking about, okay, if we have a city now and we know when we do it this way, it's not going to work as good as when we do it that way. Uh, what are the things that we can change with the city? What are the rules that we can give urban planners in order to have better cities? Um, and there are ways to evaluate that with numeric modeling. And this is how these programs look, very simple actually. And I also put some results there. The difficulty is, for example, what we did in here, we put in trees. You cannot just try out a tree. You cannot just put a tree out there, wait 20 years, and then see whether it changed every, anything. So you have to find a way to do that virtually. Uh, I'm not saying that these programs work perfectly, but we're trying to get as close to something real as we can. So on the right side, you can see some of the results, uh, null being the status quo. And then we put in some changes. We added green areas and trees. And we changed the roofs of the buildings, because as soon as you change the surface, it's also going to change the whole climate. And we changed the pavements and so on. So we tried different things. And this is what the simulation told us what's going to happen. And we also had a very close look at the urban microclimate in Vienna. Here, uh, these are the weather stations that we actually looked at. Um, you can already see from the pictures that the environment surrounding those stations is very different. And what we found out is that also the temperature is very different. So even throughout Vienna, we have a big, big diversity of temperatures, of environments within the city. Why is this important for us as, an, as architects, for example? Not just because of the habitability of the urban climate, but also because we have a lot of buildings out there. And if you put the same building in different places, they will perform different. And this is one example. We took four different buildings. We put them in different locations. And we again performed simulation in order to see how different do they work in these places. And the first three buildings are residential buildings. And you can see they, they work quite different. The heating is not so much, although 20% off is already a lot. But with the cooling, it's even worse. So predicting the cooling of buildings is very much is very difficult because you need to have exact data of the real location you put the building in. Um, another thing I was already talking before is urban density we were trying to look at. Because once you change the urban density, you also change the urban environment. So it all comes together again, and you change the urban climate. This is uh, an example of Graz. Uh, if you, Graz is on the left picture, and depending on looking at the example of other cities, you can see how big Graz would be in order to provide environment for the same amount of people. So the far right one is New York. 
if you want to put the same amount of people as living in Graz in New York, this is how much space you would need with the urban architecture that you have there. So the density in cities is quite different. And we were trying to do some simulation there too. Uh, actually, a colleague of mine is doing that. I'm not doing this myself. We're working together on this. Um, and we're trying to find ways in order to densify cities. So we're trying to find rules and a simulation where we can say, OK, this would be, this is the city how it is now. And if I obey those rules, this is the maximum that I can build there in addition. And we're not saying that with this simulation, we can tell every architect or urban planner what to do. The only thing that we're seeing is this, is this is showing you the maximum volume you can out of there. Now, you need to do your job and find out what's good for the city, what's good for the society there, and what's also good in terms of reasonable architecture. We're just building those volumes, basically. So. This is what I'm actually doing now. So now we have said three things that I wanted to do and haven't, haven't done actually. Now we're coming, uh, two things. Now we're coming to the third one. So after not being a world champion, not being a famous architect or work for one, uh, one of the things I think everybody wants to do at some point in their life is saving the world. So, I mean, you could say with all those environmental stuff and trying to be more sufficient and all those urban stuff, you're kind of trying to save the world. But I mean, who's going to read that? Um, so it's, the community is very small. And until something gets really introduced or implemented, it takes a quite, quite some time. So I think I was thinking, OK, am I in any way saving the world today? So maybe a little bit by teaching. Because in my job, it's also included that all the things that I do in research, I have to tell to the students. So I'm involved in a lot of teaching. And I'm trying to, to tell them what is out there, what you can do, uh, and where we are standing right now. Uh, most of my teaching is actually not even involving environmental stuff, but also a lot of acoustics and light. So I'm doing quite a bit in this area. And then I have a second thing. I also have a very interesting project. Uh, it's a scientific project, but it's also a development project. Um, I'm leading an, a peer project in Gaza. Uh, we are working together there with the university, the Islamic University of Gaza. And what we are trying to do there is we are helping them, or together we're actually developing um, a curriculum for the university there, for the master students, uh, in order to help them to have a more, to know more about the environment, to have a more sustainable education in terms of architecture, so to deal with their problems and their needs. Um, and for me, in order to understand that, I had to travel there. So I actually went to Gaza last year for a few days. And there you see, basically, they don't have it like we here. They don't have electricity all the time. They don't have water all the time. Around eight hours or 10 hours a day, they don't have any electricity. So the goal also of this uh, curriculum is to empower the students to deal with those things. So when you're a planner, when you're an architect, how can I build a house that needs less energy? Or how can I build something that can cope with not having energy for some time? It's quite hot there in summer. So if you cannot turn on your air conditioning because you don't have electricity, you need a house that actually works without D air conditioning. So, or if you know you won't have electricity for eight hours, but you want your, your uh, kids to have light in order to do their homework or to play or to read something, then you need a house that actually produces electricity. How can you do that? And this is the idea behind this project. We want to teach the students to cope with that. But we are also trying to teach people who are already in the planning process on doing that. So now I saved the world. One more thing I wanted to, to do, which brings me back to working for famous architects. I always thought, like 20 years ago, ah, if I, if I'm 30, when I'm 35, I'm going to work in, I don't know, London, New York, or travel around all the time and whatever. Actually, I'm still here. And I haven't left Vienna that much. 
<laughs> so just for traveling, but not for working or for studying. But on the other hand, I have kids, and that's also nice. So sometimes life just gives you other things, and other, uh, other things that you like or other things that you like to do. So now we have the last one. Um, coming back to the first step again, what I really enjoyed in architecture when I was studying was also this touching things, building something physical. So even though I'm most of the time working at the university, I only have a part-time position here, so I'm only tw working 25 hours at the university. And instead of spending the rest of the time with my kids, I actually work as a freelancing architect and I try to really build things. So why am I doing this is because, first of all, I love architecture still, even though being a scientist now. Um, but I also think that you have to implement and the things that you're researching on. You have to bring them out there, you have to bring the things together. Because this gives me an insight, what is possible, what can I do on a construction site, and it could, links the two worlds together. And I think that's a very important part, at least for me. And so I always try to have at least one project going on. Actually, this is one of the, uh, the three pictures, not the one with the new house, but the other three. This is a big renovation project I'm doing right now. It's a very old house, and we are trying to update it and make it livable for a family. And it has been empty for 15 or 20 years now. So it's quite exciting to get into touch with all the things and spend all the time on the construction side again. And it's also demanding because not only in science you have the issue about being the only woman in a room sometimes, but especially on construction sites you have the issue. When we have uh, meetings there, it's, uh, it was very interesting. Just last week, I, uh, the woman who owns this building, and uh, she's my, um, she gave me this job, she went there with me to have the discussion with the, the, all the companies involved. And afterwards she called me and she said, you know, it was very funny to watch you. There was you and there were these 10 elderly men walking behind you and just waiting for you to give them the word. So actually, I think as a woman, this is quite cool <laughs> when they all have to listen to you. So, but I think now we have talked enough about this. So just one thing, uh, actually it took me the whole night now to prepare for this. I was sitting in front of a white piece of paper for like two weeks now. It was very difficult. And I'm also a person I think who needs a lot of pressure in order to get something done like this. So it's not very easy. So, but one thing that really came up when I was thinking about that is this one, sentence, I think everybody has heard that before, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. So my plans, all the five of them, didn't really work out. But this doesn't mean that I'm not happy or that I didn't reach what I wanted to reach. It's just sometimes you find out that the goals are different or they change or you develop or whatever. So it just never turns out the way you think of it at the first thing. So. This is where I am now, and I have now I've also put my position there. Um, right now, I'm actually a university assistant, and I finished my PhD like two years ago, and actually, I don't know where I'm gonna be in five years. I don't even know where I'm gonna be in one year. So, we'll see. So, thank you for listening, and yeah, if you have any questions, I will try to answer them.